Coach Schumann here for Success for Life podcast. Back again, we've had a little break. The summer's been a little light, mostly my fault because I've been enjoying it. But we're back with a great guest. We're going to talk a lot about performance at work, um, how to get the most out of your employees, what, what are some of the things you need to do in today's modern workplace, which is definitely radically changed over the last couple of years. I'm with my guest, Gregory Offner, to talk about all those things and then some. Gregory, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Coach Schumann. Thanks for having me. It's uh, it's really in, uh, I'm excited to talk to you. First of all, it's been a little break for me, so um, I haven't uh, done any of my successful life podcasts in probably uh, three or four weeks. So uh, we're, we're jumping back in, in, into the mix there, and uh, you know I'm excited to talk about because work work has changed a lot in the last couple of years for a lot of people. And you're an expert in this field. But before we dive into that, just tell everybody your background, where you come from and how you got to this kind of point where you're at now. Sure. I think like a lot of the people watching and listening, I I graduated college and then proceeded to do something that had nothing to do with my degree uh, in music, psychology and philosophy. I fell into the world of sales. And while I did okay at it, I wasn't necessarily in love with that as my job. What I really wanted to do was be an entertainer, to be a performer. So a few years into the work world, I managed to get myself a gig at a piano bar and then into dueling pianos, which if you've ever been to Vegas or you've gone to a dueling piano bar, you've seen that high energy, super engaging show. So I had kind of a double life for a long time until 2015. In 2015, on a July evening, I sat down at my regular piano bar in Philadelphia to open up the night And when I opened up my mouth, nothing came out. This found me in a doctor's chair, uh, doctors who are experts staring at my vocal cords going, oh, my God, what is all that? And they said I had about two months until I lost my voice permanently. Rather than give up, I decided there's got to be something we can do. And they said we could try surgery. So now 15 surgical procedures on my voice later Uh, I've reinvented myself. I left the work world. I took that experience in silence and disengaging from conversation and from social activity and merged it with my background in philosophy, psychology, and and my real life work experience. And now I serve organizations around the world as a keynote speaker, as a corporate consultant, and I help organizations create a tip jar culture in their own companies. Uh, This is the type of culture that engages both the audience and the performer. Because depending on where we're at in the business, we may be the audience, we may be the performer, and we can get into that. And it helps people create the type of performance that leaves their customer cheering for an encore at the end of the day, whether that's their colleague, their client, you know, whomever that might be. What we really want is to deliver and to receive the type of performance that people want over and over and over again. That's really interesting. First of all, wildly interesting background. Dueling pianos. I used to be one of my favorite things going to see. Um, in any time I go out, especially when I was younger, dueling pianos is like the whole the whole place was engaged in it, and and I've uh, seen it in quite a few places. So, um, so that's a really interesting background. Now, having been someone who's had surgery on his vocal cords, I've had three, um, not fifteen, but I've had three, and they were polyps. I don't know if that's what 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 it was with you, but they were sitting on my vocal cord, and I was. Uh, I'm a football coach for 20 years, was a football coach for 20 years. And I thought that, that contributed a lot to it, obviously yelling and, and, and talking loudly and stuff like that. Um, so I could see, you know, singing ha- has, as what a detriment that could possibly be. And I know a little bit um, about it because you have to be quiet for pe- long periods of time. Once you get that surgery, very long periods of time and, um, uh, which could, re- if you don't, could really destroy your voice long term. So is is that what happened, or is it? Uh... Yeah. So it was a mixture. I, I I had sort of like the holy trinity. I had polyps, I had nodules, and I had cysts wow. on my vocal folds. Uh, the doctor who happens to be in Philadelphia, he is the guy in the world of vocal surgery. Like he's invented more of them than any other surgeon at. He looked at my voice and he said, I've never seen someone who's performing professionally with vocal cords this badly damaged. Um, And so, you know, that there's quite a lot of silence 
that follows. And in fact, for, for a period of time, I was known as the white guy with the whiteboard because everywhere I went, I'd have to bring, you know, a little personal dorm size whiteboard like this and a dry erase marker with me so that I could attempt to participate in conversations. One of the things that I learned through that experience was that even my best friends and sometimes even my family, you know, the people that loved me and cared about me and, and wanted to know how I was doing, even sometimes they disengaged from a conversation with me because it's very difficult to keep up. I mean, scribbling as fast as I can, it's either illegible or impossible to keep up with the conversation. And if you add a cocktail, you know, how, 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 how interested are you in reading chicken scratch after your second or third cocktail? I mean, not that interested. So the parallel that the listeners can take away from that is that even our best customers, even our best employees, if we add enough friction to the experience, we'll disengage. And this is that critical revelation that folks, I don't think, have really zeroed in on. You know, we spend millions of dollars and thousands of hours in the business world trying to increase engagement from our people. But no matter how hard we try, all of that gets dashed away if we don't eliminate the moment of disengagement. And that's really what my work is about. It's, it's not so much creating more engagement. It's eliminating the moment of disengagement, that, that moment in the employee experience when we make a very conscious decision that this job, this leader, this experience is not going to or is not willing to or is not able to give me what I want. And we disengage. And when organizations eliminate that moment, the engagement problem kind of fixes itself. It's, it's sort of like that conversation we had several years ago about the debt ceiling. If you remember that, you know, some folks said, we got to raise the debt ceiling. And other folks said, we got we to gotta rein in the spending. And somebody put the analogy out there that if your house was filling up with sewage, if a sewage pipe broke and sewage was just spilling out into your house, would you want a bigger house or would you want to stop the sewage? Right? right. In this case, disengagement is the sewage. We don't need more engagement. We need less moments of disengagement. Okay. So that's, that's a very, very interesting point. So explain to me how people get disengaged um, and uh, in the workplace or, you know, in the company, like what they're doing. Um, how does that happen um, at the workplace specifically, you know, when it comes to like, Someone works for you, you're the leader, and you know this. You, it's not like people who are in charge don't know this is happening, right? They, you, Anyone who has some level of intuitive, I mean, sometimes I guess they do, but uh, don't know. But it's important that as a leader, you start, you know, one of their better skills to becoming a leader, to getting in that position in a lot of cases, is that they can see that things are happening. The problem is, First of all, how does it happen? And then what are the steps that people can do as leaders when they recognize this starting to happen? Mm -hmm. So let's let's go big and then bring it down small, okay. right? Because at a, at a very large level, excuse me, at a very at a very big level, 30,000 foot view, the answer is kind of simple. It's kind of tweetable. People disengage when your problem becomes my problem. And this is on both sides of the fence. This is employees and employers. Think about the conversation of a great performer in their performance review with their boss. And the boss says, gosh, you know, uh, we've had a really tough quarter. And I know that you've been smashing your quota. But just as an organization, we're not where we need to be. So that, that raise, it's, it's just not going to happen. The top performers thinking that sounds like a you problem, not a me problem. You've got to figure out how to solve that problem. Don't don't make your revenue problem my problem because I'm over here smashing my quotas, doing what I have to do. And I don't want to go into multiple examples because we're short on time. But the antidote, again, 30,000 foot level, really simplistic, tweetable, is to turn it into a partnership. Get on the same side of the table and say, how are we? going to come to a resolution? How are we going to approach this? And I've, I've seen this play out at piano bars. And this was shown to me by my first mentor that when we make our problem, the audience's problem, 
you know, let's say there is a technical issue with the keyboard or we get a request that we don't know or something distracts us and we screw up a song, the audience disengages and it's very hard to win them back. We can spend the next 15, 20 minutes trying to play the best songs that we know, trying to give away free beer to this table that just got uh, impacted by whatever's going on. The cost of raising engagement is expensive. If only we can eliminate that moment of disengagement, it solves many of our problems. So let's let's bring that down and make it a little more narrow. People disengage when they perceive their voice is not going to be heard, when they perceive it's not safe for their voice to be heard, meaning if I speak up in this meeting about in this meeting about what I believe, that's going to put me on the short list of people who we used to call well-placed for life. You're getting passed over for every promotion because you said the wrong thing at the wrong time. So it doesn't have to be true. It just matters that your people believe it to be true. So perception is reality. So when people believe their voice has no volume, so so it's that they're not even going to be listened to, when they perceive that it's not safe to be listened to, and when they perceive that there's no purpose, meaning even if I speak up, nobody cares, nobody's going to do anything. So how do we stop those, those three moments? That's the real question that, that, that people want to know. How do we avoid this moment of disengagement? And from, a, from an organizational level, it's actually kind of simple. We have to treat people as if they are partners in this performance experience. Imagine a choir. Choirs only work when the voices blend in unison. Obviously, if there's an intentional solo, you know, that's a different story. But when the voices blend in unison, a choir sounds angelic. But when folks are trying to showboat or stand out or, or make one voice rise above all the others, then the whole point, the whole purpose of a choir goes out the window. The whole purpose of an organization is, it's, is, is that if you look at the definition, it's a group of people who come together to achieve a certain goal. When people believe that this isn't a choir, that this is a solo act, they disengage. So as leaders, we have to constantly be looking for ways to bring our people in as a partnership. That doesn't mean that we're going to split the profits with everybody. It it doesn't mean that you all of a sudden have decision-making say in acquisitions or things like that. But when it comes to problem solving, we want to engage people as a partner. Oh, I can't hear you, coach. I think you're muted. There are some interesting things there. So um, from, a, from a partnership standpoint, uh, you know, so for example, top salesperson that you brought up, um, I think that's a fundamental flaw in leadership if the top top salespeople have an issue and aren't um, being rewarded. So there's there's much more than, than just um, them not being – a partner in it, there's a major, major flaw in your system as a whole if top top performers aren't being rewarded in, in some capacity. So I think that's a big part of it. And, and that may be, you know, the engagement part and listening to what they have to say from an input standpoint. But for me as a salesperson, you know, going if I was going into it, I would want to know what my rewards were and if they were capped and if I did well, what would what would be the negative. So th- there there are some issues in that aspect when you join an organization and understanding what the fundamental values of that organization are. And then the issue I think with disengagement comes when the fundamental values do not align with the person that is a part of the organization. So how does that begin to happen? So from a disengagement standpoint, how do those values misalign? And that obviously a lot of that has to go with communication and partnership, um, I think comes from their ability to communicate what the values are, expectations, and, you know, seeking that, that uh, alignment on that. So you don't get to that point where you 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 have to have that conversation where you say hey bad quarter things are going out bad quarters are going to have they're happening all over the place right so how does um how does a group of people disengage uh in a just bad environment in general meaning uh right now the economy as far as uh if you look at stock prices 
everything across the board, great stocks to bad stocks, right, are are down. Some are down more than others. Fantastic companies are down. So that means that bonuses and things like that that may normally have been paid out are not going to get paid out in the same capacity, right? So the problem about you versus me or you um, you problem versus me problem is, hey, if I'm getting as a leader a major bonus and the people below me aren't, there's obviously a you versus me problem. That's a huge issue. There's no partnership there. If that's not happening, and this leads to my question, uh, if that's not happening and there are a situation where values are aligned, but expectations of what people have received in the past are not happening really just it could have nothing to do with leadership it could be we are in a down economy right or how do you handle that level of disengagement and explain that to people that things are are going on there because the i I think the low-hanging fruit is hey values are misaligned i joined this company for this reason that's an easy one Let's say values are aligned. Now things don't go our way and I'm an employee under leadership. And for the most part, I've been really satisfied when things have been going. Now things for some reason aren't going the way that we want them to. Um, I'm performing pretty well, but maybe, you know, it's not necessarily bad, but maybe not as good as past. But everything else is aligned. Now, Now I feel disengaged because I feel like, is there a chance for success here or not? How do I handle that? Okay, so that's, I mean, it's a big question. There's there's a lot there. Um, one is that disengagement is a decision. Yeah, it's not a feeling. We may feel ignored. We may feel, so there's a, a, a researcher in psychology, his name is Khan, and the three things we need to feel are that the work we're doing has meaning, that we have the capacity meaning both like the physical energy, the time and space to do the work, but also the ability to do that work um, and that it is safe to do the work. These are, these are the three conditions that need to be met for us to feel engaged. But disengagement is a decision. It's not a feeling. So when someone's made the decision to disengage, they're saying those three conditions don't exist and I'm not going to get or I don't believe I'm going to get what I want from this transaction. So the first thing organizations can do in the circumstance you've, you've painted out is to understand their audience. One of the keys, uh, my first mentor in the world of, of, of piano playing, being a professional performer, um, the key to engagement in any performance is understanding your audience. And there are three types of people in any audience. I don't care if it's a business. I don't care if it's a ball game. I don't care if it's a piano bar. Those three types are keepers, leapers and sleepers and it's funny we were, we were just at the mall getting something for my two, two-year-old daughter um and i dude i was just checked out i i just i needed a break anyway because i've been working all week and we we're at the mall and i was like god just find me a comfy chair to sit down in you know i had i had no interest in what was going on i was kind of there begrudgingly and you know just looking for a starbucks and i realized in this situation i'm a sleeper like I'm there cause I kind of got to be there and I don't really have anywhere else to be. And if I had a better option, I'd, I'd probably be interested, you know, if there were like a, like a sports memorabilia store, I'd go check that out, but there wasn't. So, so here I find myself. And in the corporate world that happens too. someone falls into a job out of college. It's, it's good enough, but not so good that I want to give discretionary effort to the job, but they keep paying me. So I'll keep showing up. I mean, we're hearing about this term quiet quitting right now. That's that's mm. really describing that there is an influx or a growth in the sleeper category in the work world right now. So now you, now you got your leapers. Leapers are, are easy to, to spot. In the piano bar, they're your bachelor parties, your bachelorette parties, your birthday parties. They're coming here to kick off the night, but they're not they're not staying here all night. They want to get a couple songs, get a couple drinks, and then they want to get on to the next place. They're hopping around. In the professional world, it's like someone who gets out of college, wants to work at Google, but doesn't really have the maybe the tech skills. Yeah, maybe they were a business major, but they don't have the tech savvy. So they take an entry level job at a small tech firm in their hometown. They get some coding skills under their belt. They get some experience and projects under their belt. Two or three years later, they want to go to Google. So they're not at that small company to, to rise up and be the CEO. They're there for a specific purpose, and then they want to leap 
to that next role. And the same thing can happen at, you know, let's say you're at Google and you're not rising up the ranks as fast as you want. You know that if you go to a smaller tech firm, you could become the chief technology officer in a minute. So they want to make a different leap. Then there's our keepers. And these are the type of folks that every company romanticizes and that, you know, every bar wants. It's, it's the norms. If you know to go back to Cheers, if you remember that TV show, always going to be there, always going to be in that seat at the bar. I have a buddy named John. He, he is a keeper at this one particular bar here in Philly. But in the, in the work world, it's a little different. We've got two types of keepers. We've got our rock stars. Those are the salespeople, you know, I used in that earlier example that are crushing their quota. They're rising up the ranks. We want more of them, of course. But we've also got our rock steadies. Those are the people that are dependable. I'm going to come in. I'm going to clock in at nine. I'm going to work my tail off for you. But I'm also going to leave at five because the job isn't what, what really drives me. I love where I work. I love what I do. I love who I'm doing it with. But my passion is my five to nine, 5 a.m. to 9 a.m., 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. That, that's where I'm fueling my passion. So understanding who the person is that we're speaking to, right? If they're a keeper, they're going to have certain desires, drives, even though they're, they're, they're lined up with our values, like you described, they're going to have a certain desire that a leaper won't have. Again, a leaper is, can be an A player. They could be a rock star, but they want to get somewhere else. And it's important to understand that because then we frame the conversation of how is what we're going through together? Remember, establish the partnership. How is what we're doing right now going to get you where you want to go? And the sleepers, I think, are the most fascinating category for a leader, for someone who's interested in leadership. Sleepers are, they are, they're dormant talent. They are the greatest potential transformative source inside any organization because a leader's responsibility is to wake that sleeper up, connect them to a purpose, connect them to an impact, awaken that passion. Now they may wake up and look around and go, you know, this isn't where I wanted to sleep. And they move on to the next role. That's fine. That's going to happen. But when we wake them up, if they turn into a leaper or a keeper, we're going to get value out of them because it's a transaction. We give value at work and in exchange, we get something that's valuable to us. My, my caveat here for anybody who's newly into the workforce, if the salary is the most valuable thing you're getting from your job, you have a problem. You may not have figured it out yet, but your salary should not be the most valuable thing you get from the job. It should be experience, connections, a um, an easier step to the next place that you want to go. So, how do, how do we partner with them to, to 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 figure out, you know, how we can get them to accomplish the things or see if they can accomplish the things that we want to accomplish? So, keepers sound like they're probably easiest to uh to work with and motivate because they they're there already with a purpose and they're kind of bought in leapers are are there for a, a time period they'll perform very well for you they're probably good to motivate in the short run and then you you'll see the dip when they're ready to go anyway i think um and then you'll have that conversation you'll figure out if they're going to be uh keepers or just going to stay as leapers and they're going to be gone the sleepers are so difficult because uh, are sometimes are they worth uh, waking up and and they have to figure that out. But my issue my my issue that I, I want to address is how do we figure out you know which one of those people are which, and then um, and then how do we put them on our team properly? Because we don't want the sleepers to bring down the keepers, right? I mean, if there's a sleeper, you wake him up and now he's, I don't know, disgruntled for whatever reason. You know, the the, the disengagement thing is, is a, I, to me, is such a difficult thing because as a person that's led a company for 20 years, I've seen multiple different levels of disengagement. I've seen the beginning phases of it and I... I've rarely seen people who start to disengage re-engage and be successful, right? So the preventative part's a big thing, but how much of it has to do with us and how much of it has to do with their attitude towards things? How, how you know, this is I I this is a fascinating topic because it's so difficult to kind of measure those things. 
Can you explain a little bit of that? So another big question. It starts with the, it starts with the questions we ask. And, and let, before I even get into that, it really comes down to honesty. There is a lack of honesty in the workplace. And I don't know that it's malicious, but it's pervasive. Mm. And there are these little lies that compound into really big problems. And they start in the interview process because theoretically you've got something that I want, right? You've got a paycheck. You've got stability. There's something about this job that I want. But most people believe if they come out and say exactly what it is that they want, they won't get the job. So they 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 obfuscate. They sort of juke. They... They hint that they're going left, but they really go right because that's what they think you want. So this is where it starts. Mm. But then it piles on in, in performance reviews. And, you know, if you're a company that's smart enough to do the 90 day re-interview where 90 days in, you bring them into a room and you say, hey, tell me everything you're seeing right now because you've got fresh eyes and we don't. That is the best source for intelligence right now. Somebody who's not inculcated, they're not brainwashed. I use that term very loosely. Um, you know, they're, they're not. Um, they don't have enough bias. They don't have enough baggage. They haven't been there long enough. So they've got fresh eyes and they're going to give you good information. If we, if we, if we, if we just bring a little more honesty back into these conversations and that's scary. It's especially scary when you're having a conversation with someone who can fire you. And that's why I'm an advocate for more coaching relationships in the workplace in right. addition to managers. Um, but if we just bring a little more honesty in, that's going to go a long way to solve some of these issues. Now, mm. to well, I, want, about, I, want stop, I want to stop you real quick because you brought up a absolute golden point, the interview process. I, I have always felt that the interview process, the mistake, and I've, I'm sure I've made this a million times myself. Both parties are busy selling. Okay. The company is selling who they are and why you should be a part of that. Right. Instead of interviewing them. They're selling them. And the candidate is selling why he should be a part of this company and selling all the things that are instead instead of and I think your honesty part is very valuable. Like there should be a hey, this is what we do well, this is what we don't do well, this is what we can do and what we can't do. And you know, but you know what happens is I I believe I believe you're really right on this. The person, the guy who runs the company, or or the human resources person, their job is to get the top people they can get right. So they're selling. They're, they're not as much. Yeah, maybe you know if they bring in someone in for an interview, they already think that this person has somewhat level of capability. They're selling, and they're just kind of weeding out the people that sell them best uh, on the process. So both sides are selling, and there's not a whole lot of information gathering, and. I, I can tell you this because this is, this is an interesting side of it. As a person who's coached football, so I've owned my own company for 20 years, but I've always coached high school football up until the last couple of years. I always, in the interview process, was selling myself. And then the other side was always selling what they thought was so great about their program, right, or, or what had to be improved in their program. But they were selling it regardless. It wasn't until my last couple of interviews did – the last few interviews and, and now I'm, I'm, I have a seven year old, so I'm helping him out and, and as he goes through sports. So I kind of stepped away for a little while, but my last few interviews, I said, you know, I'm no longer going to sell myself. I'm going to tell people what I believe, uh, my, what my philosophy is, the things that I've accomplished, but I'm also going to be candid in what I'm looking for in a pro in a program and I found interesting things from that. The most, the, the best thing about it is the only people I've worked with are people that I've wanted to work with in that process and realized that like my candid and openness was a valuable thing. The people who did not value that did not hire me or if I was there did not want me around anymore, which I found to be a great thing because I realized I didn't want to be there either because it, we were all, be, for lack of a word, better word, BSing each other all the time, right? So you're busy BSing each other, and then nobody knows anything about anything. But the people that I've worked with that have been the best have been people that have always said to me, hey, you know, this this you can do. Oh, you know, this goes too far. And then I could say, well, I think this is why I should be able to go this far, right? 
and they don't take it personal. They say, hey, you know what? We can do this. We can't do that, right? And that dialogue has always led to the best workplace environments. The worst environments have always been the dance around, like what you said, the dance around everything. Everything's supposed to be peaches and cream, you know, but I think you're better off getting to the point in most cases and people appreciate that. And, and, and you're right. The ones who disengage from that are probably the, if you do, if you have an honest approach in the workplace, the people that disengage from that are probably not the people that you want around because they just want you to BS them all the time and they'll end up bringing down your organization. So I think your point about honesty and, and starting in the interview process is so dead on. Why then? And uh, uh, why does this happen? What is the reason why people feel they got to BS each other all the time? I think if I knew that, I would probably <laughs> be able to retire immediately. <laughs> I, I've given you some tough ones and you've done a great job with them. Well, but here's, yeah. here's, here's something that I'll point out. And this is a newer idea that I'm polishing up. Um, so if you think about the recycling symbol on a trash can, right, it's got those three arrows. I want you to imagine it with a fourth arrow and those four arrows represent four stakeholders in sort of the corporate equation. Yeah. So we've got investors or stockholders. That's one arrow. Then we've got our senior leadership, or I'll say anyone that can be compensated with something in addition to their salary. Yeah. Then we've got our line level employees. So those are folks that only get salary or hourly wage. And then we've got our customer. This is sort of the food tree or the life cycle of an organization. And for too long, we've been beat over the head with the idea that it's the investor or the shareholder that is, is really who we need to be looking out for. And as long as the executives or the folks who get additional compensation, look out for the shareholder, the shareholders make sure they keep getting more additional compensation, but it kind of breaks down from there because while the employees look out for the executives who look out for the shareholders, nobody's really looking out for the employees. And I'm, I'm making a generalization here, oh, but yeah. And then at the very bottom, in many cases, is the customer. And the customer is sort of left with whatever the residual that the employee and that the organization can, can put out. So there's, a, there's a, 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 an acronym called MVP, right, which in football is most valuable player. But in a lot of business scenarios, it stands for minimum viable product. What is the absolute minimum that I can give you that you will pay for? And that's what many organizations shoot for. And, and I think there is a, a school of thought revolution that's happening right now where folks are saying enough, enough of giving me the bare minimum so that shareholders can make the absolute maximum. And I'm not denigrating shareholders. I, the, the shareholders help organizations get off the ground, but they need to have a long, hard look in the mirror and realize that they're not as valuable as they've been trying to make everyone believe they are. Money is widely available in the world. The way to get money is to create impact. But shareholders aren't the person we need to create impact for. It's the customer. The customer is the one who gives the company the money to pass on to the shareholder. So I think it should be customer primacy, not shareholder primacy. And shareholders should be at the bottom getting whatever's left over. That's, that's the idea. They get the residual. They get the remainder as the incentive to invest in this idea that's going to change the world. Nobody wants to go to work to enrich a shareholder or to enrich a CEO, but people will wake up every day and spring out of bed to impact the world. And so I, I encourage, I beg my audiences to stop putting income before impact on both sides of the table, on the organizational side and on the individual side, because there are too many people who go to work and say, I'm going to get mines, and they show up at eight, and they leave at five, and as long as it checks, shows up on Friday, they'll keep showing up, but they are going to do the absolute minimum and continue to try and bang their employer for the absolute maximum paycheck. And on the other side, we've got organizations whose whole structure is set up to eat away at little bits of quality until they're at the minimum viable product that a customer will tolerate, and they can produce the maximum amount of revenue. I'm not anti-revenue. But I'm saying, if you want to be in business to make money, go rob banks. Right. That's well, Chick Fil A is 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 
is your is your, like your perfect example who kind of take p- care of both parties and almost nobody does it well, but takes care of both parties equally well. Like if you're going to a fast food chain and you're going to get a food product that you expect to have a decent quality above, well, Chick-fil-A goes over and above on that. Like they're chasing you down. And I, I don't know if you've ever been to Chick-fil-A, but they're, you know, they have people out front. They have another person. They, they have customer service, basically people. I mean, they're people taking your orders, but they're, they're all over the place and they chase you down with your order. And something's not, out, if they make a mistake, they're, they're over the top apologetic. And this, this goes for everyone I've been to, which is amazing. Okay. Cause this is, we're talking about fast food here, right? Like even when you, you know, you go to McDonald's, you can go to McDonald's and you have a absolutely fantastic uh, experience um, uh, as far as the people you deal with. And then you go to another McDonald's and have a terrible experience. Chick-fil-A, you're having a consistent thing there every single time. And I think it's because they work hard to take care of both sides really well. Right? So they're taking care of the customer. They're taking care of the employee. Mo- what are most of their employees? Low minimum wage workers. But yet they're finding a, a reason to come there and perform very well. Whereas if you go to, I don't know, so many Burger Kings, I, I hate to pick on certain places, but so many of them have closed because just basically the employees don't care, right? They throw your food. It used to be Burger King used to be get it your way, right? It used to be. They used to do this. I'm talking 80s and 90s. They used to do it. Now, forget it. Nobody cares. They, they don't even care. You come to the door, they, you know, wh- whether you're there or not, they could care less, right? Well, now, and, and now we're just two guys having a conversation because we're in a really specific niche that's not necessarily yeah, yeah. No, part I'm of what I talk it about. It's an but, example. It's an example. It's, it's fascinating as I'm listening to you talk and I'm thinking about my experiences at all of these places and many others that we didn't name. The A, a, a stark difference is that even in the drive through line, you're talking to a person. And I mean, I, I know that yes. at the McDonald's drive through you're, you're talking to a person, but at Chick-fil-A, they're literally standing outside. It's a conversation with another human being face to face. I'm not saying that's the only answer, but when we talk about the, the honesty that we want to bring back into business and the, uh, the partnership that we're trying to establish, it's a lot harder to treat someone who's face to face in front of you as less than a partner. And it's much easier to do that when you're hiding behind emails, when you're hiding behind a speaker box and talking to somebody in a building that you can't see and they only see your car from a video screen. I don't know if that's the reason why. But when you talk about that incentive to engage, it is about measuring impact. And we used the example of salespeople earlier. I believe that organizations and the leaders within them need to take a hard look at how they evaluate the impact that even a receptionist lets you, you know, uh, and I I use that example because, you know, really their job is to answer the phones or do this or do that. And it's kind of like hard to define, you know, what, when, when is a receptionist job done? Well, when the phone stops ringing, I guess. So 5 PM, I don't know. Leaders need to take a look at that and say, how does a receptionist measurably and demonstrably go above and beyond? How can I say this was my job? This was extra pay me. And it doesn't have to be in the form of cash, but At the piano bar, when you want to hear a request, that request slip is accompanied by something, you know, if you're in the States, green and presidential. Yeah, that is discretionary incentive for my discretionary effort because I'm paid to be there and play until the bar closes anyway. You want me to play your song? Show me some discretionary incentive. And it could be that you buy me a drink. Or it could, you know, whatever that incentive is, it doesn't, it doesn't have to boil down to money. And this is where some companies have been stuck in the last couple of years. They think that the only incentive is money or trips or the ones who have wised up are doing training, but they're training you for the job you're in. They're not training you with transformational life-changing skills. And this is, this is really the meat of how I help organizations change. The organizations who want sustainable growth should stop focusing in, insanely focusing on the income and start focusing on the growth of their people. Because as your people get better, the organization gets better. As your football team gets better, the results get better. As the, as the players, I should say, on your team get better individually, the team collectively gets better because of those individual improvements. 
That's where we need to focus our time is in growing our people, transform the individual to transform the business. Stop focusing on how do we cut a cost here? How do we provide a lower cost, uh, you know, piece of the pie here, make the people better. I've, I've in my whole career in sales, I've found that top line growth covers up pretty much everything else. Right. But we get to a point where we can't churn customers anymore. It's, it gets too expensive. We need to grow our people. That's where that top line growth comes from. That's a great, great point. It's, it's very, I, I could talk to you about this all day. It's very, very interesting. I love, I love your idea of, of, of thwarting disengagement, which I, I I believe is such a hard thing because people aren't always going to communicate that they're disengaged is just going to happen, right? So to be able to thwart it and set things up, I mean, communication is such an important thing. Before I let you let you go, um, any any final things you want to share um, w- with our audience? Yeah, you know, my experience with my vocal cords made me realize that someday. We'll all do something for the last time. When I sat down at that piano, I had no idea that was the last time I'd ever perform professionally at a piano bar. When you wake up tomorrow, could be the last time you do so. So if you're in a job and you've already made that decision to disengage, move on. If you're trying to make a leap, tell your supervisor, And if they partner with you, great. And if they don't, move on. We hesitate to make the changes in life we want because our brains are hardwired to avoid loss. We will avoid losing $5 at the expense of an opportunity to earn 10. It's just how we're wired. But that doesn't serve us. Not in the world we live in today. It it did when we were running from bears and lions and tigers, you know, back in uh, hundreds of years ago, but not anymore. So if you're going to develop something, develop, develop this machine right here. Focus in on soft skills like negotiation, understanding body language, um, even, even communication skills, because those will take you everywhere you want to go. And coach, thank you for giving me the opportunity to come on here and, and, and talk to your listeners. Oh, it's fantastic having you. You shared tremendous insight. You handled some difficult questions that I definitely think you, you know you handled it really, really well. I mean, just awesome stuff. Uh, what's what's the best way for people to get in touch with you? How can they get in contact with you? Sure. Uh, when you're coaching, you know, to work with you further. Yeah. So, um, just as as an aside, um, if you want ideas on those soft skills, I almost forgot to mention this. Um, if you Get out your cell phone and text 33777. So text that number. Text the word KEYS, K-E-Y-S, K-E-Y-S to 33777. I'll email you a one sheet with seven of the most in-demand soft skills. I call them the seven keys of success that you can start to develop in yourself right now. And that sheet will explain what they are, how each one benefits you, and some some resources that you can use to go start developing them yourself. Um, The best place to get a hold of me is on Instagram. Connect with me on Instagram, DM me, let me know what you thought of the show, if you loved it, if you hated it, if you want more of it, um, or you can check out my website, gregoryoffner.com. Perfect. Thanks so much for being on today. Insight was invaluable. I mean, just unbelievable. Um, something that that so many people, especially like not just you know leaders, but people who are frontline workers can – can look at what they're doing and really assess. I love how you, you broke out those, those three points with keepers, uh, leapers and sleepers. Like you can kind of assess where you are in the process as well and say, Hey, <laughs> there's something I got to do to, to figure out where I can become a keeper. Where do I want to be? If I'm a sleeper, where do I want to be? You know, and assess that with yourself um, and start to move on that path. Awesome stuff. Thanks so much um, for being on today on the successful life podcast and have a great day. Thanks for having me.